Okay. Um, Today, we're going to this piece, for example, and um, we're hoping to learn the DFT and uh, what it means to apply DFT for an image and how to compute the DFT for an image, how to plot it. And uh, part of the discussion is really a very important topic, which is the circular convolution and uh, what that means and how it relates uh, to linear convolution. Uh, and we'll have some specific example about this important uh, Subtopic within DFT. Um, so today's lecture is really the first uh, in the second uh, module uh, of the course, which uh, talks about transform, uh, how we transform images. And uh, we'll, uh, the plan is to talk about DFT, DCT, uh, briefly about DST, KLT, uh, uh, wavelets. Um, and maybe I will just mention very briefly about directional transform. Uh, uh, as part of the wavelets and then uh, autoencoders. Uh, and finally, the, the, this whole discussion will lead us to talk about uh, uh, coding and compression for images. And that can be the subject of, of kind of showing you why transforms are really important. So, and what we have in here uh, in this diagram, um, uh, black diagram, we have the source image F, um, and we'd like to really kind of we, we took this image and we, now we are really interested in sending it to somebody else to display it on their machine through the internet. So the first thing is uh, we have two choices. Either we look at the image as uh, the intensity values. Um, and if we have 1024 by 1024, uh, then uh, we have 1 million pixels and uh, with 1 million values. And how can we compress that? And um, we will study, uh, there are certain transforms that are much better fit uh, for this kind of application, which is compaction. Can you compact the energy in these 1 million values into much fewer number of coefficients? Uh, um, so uh, what kind of representation do we have there? Uh, at the end of the day, um, all this transform or, or, or feature extraction, what we are looking for is how can we best represent the image with the minimum error? Um, and I will talk more about coding and compression. However, um, in this diagram in here, uh, after you do some kind of a transform, you have now a, uh, hopefully it's a compacting transform, means that the number of coefficients uh, that represent the image are much smaller than the total number of pixel intensity values that you started with. And after that, you start to, Quantize. Uh, quantize uh, is meaning uh, you really fix uh, the number of bits you, re you represent every single uh, coefficient in the transform. Um, and after that, uh, you have an entropy coding. We'll study uh, this later to really get rid of any redundancy left uh, in the quantized values. Uh, and you can think of that as um, if you look at the image, for example, that you're looking at my, 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 my video. If you look at some of the background, uh, there's large area that's really kind of uniform in color and uh, in the wall. And that means I really don't need to uh, send a multiple uh, coefficient in a transform domain that represent that area. I can just send one value that's enough. Um, that's the idea of really getting rid of the redundancy. And that redundancy can be even more into the temporal domain. And we'll study that more in what we refer to as motion estimation uh, and motion vectors in uh, in, uh, in video coding. And then you transmit it, you send it. Uh, there's quite a bit of happening at the network level here. Uh, I, I will I mention a few of them, but we'll not really get into details of that, uh, the streaming technology. And then um, on the other side, uh, imagine you are the receiving end of this image or this video. Uh, we'll do the inverse of everything. Uh, we'll do entropy decoding, dequantization, and then we do the inverse of the transform to display the image. And, um, and here there are really multiple steps. Uh, transform is one, quantization, entropy coding, streaming. Uh, all of these are really major steps and each one of them has a different uh, contribution to the, to the overall efficiency of the streaming, the efficiency of the compression, the efficiency, efficiency of the coding. Uh, but really the main pillar, uh, the, the, the foundation of all of this is the transform. What kind of a transform 
that will give me the most compact representation of the end. In studying T, PCT, and KLT, we'll look at basic category. Uh, usually, we uh, we represent such an image. Um, so, um, so uh, we'll go back to what we studied before, uh, the DTFT, um, discrete time Fourier transform, and here is the pair, uh, how to get uh, F mu and nu from F of M and N, and how to get F of M and N uh, using the inverse DTFT from uh, the Fourier representation of, uh, of the image. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is a very good uh, analysis tool. Um, in real life application, when you use computers to really apply the compute the free transform of your image, then uh, what you are really doing is a discrete free transform. And we'll study today uh, what that means and uh, how, how you should be careful when uh, you use DFT uh, to compute uh, your your uh, your uh, uh, filtering response. Um, so we'll just go through some definition of DFT, some properties, and then we'll spend. I would say the core uh, of today's lecture is the third bullet, which is the linear convolution versus circular convolution. This will have the the major kind of uh, you know it's a it's a it's, it's something that uh, maybe you haven't seen uh, unless you have it in your undergrad. And then uh, the rest is just how we can compute the for your images, what kind of tricks we use to have an efficient uh, computation of the FT for real images because the 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 input from an N, the intensity values are real in values. They're not complex. They're not imaginary. They have no imaginary part. Um, so, um, so the first thing um, is that the DFT is uh, transfer an image uh, from the spatial domain, from the intensity values domain to uh, the frequency domain. And through that transformation, uh, it compacts the energy, it, it, meaning that um, if you start with n by n pixel intensity values, then the number of uh, the FT coefficients with uh, values uh, that are considerable values, meaning that significance, that means they are not really very close to a zero, uh, they are fewer than the m by n pixel that you started with in the image. So it's a, it compacts the energy into fewer number of coefficients or values. Um, it, of course, it helps analyzing various processes. Um, and then uh, you have to keep in mind that DFT is um, uh, derived for uh, a periodical uh, sequence, as we'll see uh, in a few minutes. So the first thing we start with, uh, we go back to the Fourier series, uh, uh, discrete Fourier series. And uh, just to refresh your memory, um, we start with a, a signal, uh, F of M and N. And this F of M and N has a finite region of support. As you can see in here, uh, this region of support defined for small m between zero and m, and for small m between zero and capital N. Um, and then um, we would like to define this F tilde, and this F tilde, this F tilde in here, um, uh, you can see is nothing but uh, a periodic uh, representation of F. You take F and you keep shifting it around the whole plane, and K and L uh, cover the entire plane. And then um, you shift with uh, KM and LN every time. And what you are really doing is you are taking your F um, and then you are really tiling the plane with it. And this whole over um, uh, new image, we call it F tilde, uh, that has a rectangular periodicity in it. But the horizontal period is capital M, and the vertical period is capital N for this F tilde in this case. Um, again, keep in mind that F is equal to F tilde whenever we have K and L, L and E are equal to a zero, or in other words, when really are we are within that finite support region, a region of support, which means uh, they are really identical in that region of support. Um, and that's the the origin zero and zero copy of F and the F tilde plane. So now what we did in here, in short, we created a periodical uh, uh, version of F, we call it F, F tilde. So we can, with this periodicity in here, uh, then uh, we can, we know from Fourier series coefficient that we can 
represent um, this uh, periodical signal F tilde as a superposition of complex sinusoids. Uh, and the definition we are given uh, is one over M n, which over K and L. Then we have our Fourier series coefficients. Then we have e to the positive j two pi um, k m over m, and j uh, e to the j two pi uh, l n over n. Uh, these capital n and capital m these are the periodicity of f tilde in both direction horizontal and and vertical. So um, this is just a, a straight extension of the one dimensional Fourier series coefficient calculation. So or what we did in here, since f tilde is periodical, now we can really invoke this harmonical representation. Uh, we call it for your series uh, representation, uh, which is really basically nothing but a superposition of uh, sinusoids um, in this case. So now uh, we have a representation for f tilde, and now we we can calculate these capital f tilde, these the uh, for your series coefficient. Uh, using this uh, definition here. So that was a measure of M and N, and then we have the signal F tilde, the periodical signal, and then we have the complex uh, the complex exponents in here, e to the negative J2 pi, Km over capital M, and e to the negative J2 pi, uh, Ln over capital M. So now for F tilde, we have a representation, we have a, a Fourier series uh, expansion, and <coughs> we know that uh, uh, we once we have that Fourier series uh, uh, expansion, uh, uh, okay, it's here. Fourier series expansion, um, then we can really compute the DFT uh, of uh, uh, of of n, which what's really happening in here that you have the dif the Fourier series expansion here, this one, and this one here. What's really important is that this is really defined for the entire region or plane that is defined by M and N, right? If you want to restrict that uh, to be within the region of support that we started with, which is uh, between zero and capital M and between zero and capital N, then uh, what we have is uh, the two-dimensional discrete Fourier transform um, of F of M and N. So um, that basically the definition, this, this is, F of K and L, this is the DFT, summation over M and N, F of M and N, e to the negative J2 pi KM over M, uh, e to the negative J2 pi N uh, LN. And keep in mind in here, uh, within this summation, M are the variables go between zero and N because the region of support for F of M and N is between zero and M and zero and N. At the same time, we are, defining the region or the range for the variables of the BFT, K and L. So these variables in here, K and L. Um, so they are also in this definition for now, is there is a match between the DFT size, which is in this case is an A capital M, capital N, we call it M and DFT. There's the region, uh, the dimension of the DFT that we are applying, the window is M by M, which matches the region of support dimension of the original image that we are starting with, which is smaller. So uh, this is the forward definition of the two dimensional DFT. And the second equation is the inverse DFT. And uh, the difference is the, um, the sign of this exponents. Again, uh, we have a match between the dimension of the DFT and the dimension of the image, but we will change that in, in a few minutes. Um, so in here, uh, this note in here, it just said, if you remember uh, the Fourier, Fourier series um, uh, coefficients, uh, they match the Fourier DFT coefficients when K is within that region that we are defining up, up uh, in the definition. And the same thing, um, if you look at uh, if tilde, and F, they are identical within the region of support of F. Um, so uh, what this should really um, tell you is that uh, we have a DFT, and remember the, that the DFT is derived, is defined over a periodical signal, right? Uh, all what we did in here, 
why we do really F, but not F tilde, because within this region, F tilde and F are identical. That's why we have F in here. But uh, the T is defined over uh, over um, uh, for for a periodical signal uh, F tilde in here. So um, another view. So this is one um, one way to look at the FT. Uh, it's you take a, a signal, you uh, tile it in the plane, and then well, you see these coefficients, and now you have this closed form calculation to the DFT. Another uh, way to look at uh, what the DFT is, uh, which is equally important, if you remember the definition of the DTFT, uh, this is continuous in both. Uh, frequencies mu and u, and uh, this is something we studied before. The another view of how we look at DFT is that we are sampling, we are sampling uh, this uh, DTFT in the frequency domain. So uh, we are sampling with m and n, and again, uh, that means uh, the dimension of our DFT is m n DFT. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll, we'll decouple these uh, these dimensions. But for now, it's the same dimension as our image. So we are sampling the Fourier transform of the image or the discrete time Fourier transform of the image in the frequency domain. And if you remember uh, the reciprocal of what we did before, if you are sampling an image in the spatial domain, then you are really tiling um, the spectrum in the frequency domain. And the same thing in here, you are sampling the uh, the spectra in the in the frequency domain, which means that what you are already tiling the image in the spatial domain. Um, so uh, both of these, um, if you look carefully at them, uh, they are really telling you um, that we are really operating on an F tilde over a finite region, which is identical to the F. Uh, so we can really apply apply this transform. Uh, both of these of you are really very important because uh, when we talk about Circular convolution. Uh, these these ideas, um, these two views, become very handy, and both of them lead to the same thing. Um, so, um, uh, which is basically the two-dimensional DFT is nothing but it has samples of the Fourier transform, um, and uh, eventually that means you already have a periodical extension of F in the spatial domain. Um, we can just look at some of the properties uh, without really going through some of the proofs. Uh, linearity, circular shift, uh, symmetry, reflection, modulation, and classical scheme. So linearity is simple. Um, definition as before is AF plus BG equal to, uh, sorry, uh, the, the DFT of this linear combination uh, of A times F plus B times G is the same as A times the free transform F plus B times the free transform G. Um, and then here, um, the assumption is that both small F and small G, uh, they share uh, the same region of support. If they're not, you just pad uh, one with zeros. Uh, so you're gonna make them uh, of the same size. And I uh, just wanna introduce um, this notation here. Uh, this notation here is just a modulation, uh, Q, uh, uh, with double parentheses sub capital N, that means really Q modulated with N, which can be uh, represented by by this term in here. Um, you can think of this uh, as a circular shift. With a circular shift, if you have an image like this, it's a 40 by 40 image, and then you have four quadrants. Uh, two of them are have a white region, the other two have this kind of texture region. And then if you have a shift to the right by 20%, um, then uh, you, you are not really bringing undefined pixels now because this is a circular shift. Imagine this is a cylinder, and then whatever you are shifting out from the right uh, edge, you are bringing that back uh, uh, in the from the left edge. And the same thing uh, for this part. So for every single column that you are shifting it out from the right, it really be copied uh, from the left, so you don't really have any new uh, undefined values for your uh, for your uh, pixels. And the same thing in here, you are shifting up by twenty percent, up and right uh, each by twenty percent. Both all of these are just different examples of a circular shift. Uh, and the circular shift 
um, uh, it's, it's special because uh, if you have a circular shift um, by value of M naught uh, in the X direction and N naught in the N direction, and of D of T with E to the negative J two pi over M and E to the negative J two pi over M. We just use this W sub N just for short. Uh, it, it's, you can think of it just to keep things look neat, but it's really confusing to you. You just replace any uh, W N with E to the negative J two pi over capital N. Um, so this is a circular shift. So a circular shift in the, in the spatial domain uh, is, um, is being, it's the same as modulating your uh, DFT with uh, these complex exponent uh, with the same value as, as the shift. Um, yeah, sorry, these are M naught, this one here, M naught, this is N naught. Please correct, this is M naught. Does the circular shift and this is N naught. Okay. Uh, uh, symmetry, um, this becomes really handy when we talk about how can we efficiently uh, calculate DFT for real valued images, natural images, where uh, what we mean by real valued, that means the intensity values are real numbers. Uh, they don't really have an imagery component. They are not complex. Um, so uh, this is the property in here that if our signal F of M and N is real, that means the intensity values don't have a, uh, a imaginary component that is equal to a zero, uh, then what's happening in here is that DFT is a Hermitian symmetric in the circular sense. What Hermitian symmetry means, if you take the complex conjugate, um, it will be equal to the same uh, complex uh, variable with a negative sign into the into the index. So in here we have our f of k and l. This star here, subscript star, means a complex conjugate. A complex conjugate. If you remember, just changing the imaginary the sign for the imaginary component in the in the in the in the in the signal. So now, uh, how we can calculate that? That's basically the same as if we have a real f of m and n, the conjugate of our uh, capital F, which is the DFT, is the same as uh, the Hermitian, um, is the same as the circular shift of uh, f, and then the minus sign. So if you just want to keep it as simple, that f conjugate is the same as f minus k, just in one, in one dimension. Right, so this is what they define as Hermitian symmetry. Okay, so the conjugate is there is equal to the, the DFT uh, with the negative sign. So if um, that that's only the case when our f of m and n is real, uh, it's not a complex uh, signal. So if that's the case, then now if we'd like to calculate the real part of our f of uh, k and l, it will be the same as the real part of the circular shift, uh, shifted version of F, right? Because of this relationship in here, the conjugate is equal to this value. So that means the real numbers are equal and the imaginary size are equal, but with a negative sign. And that's what we have in here. So R E in here, just for real, I M for imaginary. So all of this is just defining what a Hermitian symmetry means, what it means. And this whole slide is saying that if f of m and n happens to be real, then you have this feature, which uh, says that the DFT of this real signal f is Hermitian symmetry. And what does that mean? It means um, I can look at the circular uh, shifted um, part of f, the real part will be equal to the real part of f, and the imaginary part will be equal to the imaginary part with a negative sign um, in front of it. So um, we'll, we'll, that's one, one part of it. And then the second one is the symmetry. So imagine that you have a sequence, you have a, an, an F of M and N, and it happens that this F of M and N has two components. One component is symmetric, 
and this is what we refer to as F sub S. And the second component is anti-symmetric or asymmetric, which we call it as F sub A. So now, uh, if that's the case, can, and for now we are not really assuming anything about uh, F of M and N, but uh, you can really assume it's, it's, it's real. So this means if S of M and N, the, the symmetric component, it can be computed as the addition of F of M and N plus the conjugate with the circular shift, right? With this modulation, capital M and capital N, and take the conjugate of that and divide by two. And the same thing for the asymmetric part. The only difference is that you have the negative in front of the conjugate. All of these equations, call this one, two, three, and four. If you put them all together, they will serve a purpose in a few slides. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. All what this is telling you, if you have a signal and that signal uh, the, the, is a real signal, it has symmetric component, it has an asymmetric component, then the symmetric component has the Fourier transform, which is equal to the real part of the DFT of the entire signal. And the asymmetric component will have a DFT, which is equivalent to J times the imaginary part of the DFT of the, the, the entire signal, right? So in other words, the Hermitian symmetry portion will give you the real part of DFT, and the Hermitian asymmetric portion will give you the imaginary part of DFT multiplied by J. Um, all of this can be very, very confusing and should be. Uh, however, all of this will really be very helpful when we talk about you have a natural image, and now how do you compute the DFT in very efficient, efficiently uh, without going through the entire uh, calculations and double uh, summation or even the matrix multiplication? Um, all what you need to worry about now is uh, the following. The first thing is you want to say uh, right here. The first thing is that if f of m and n is real, then the Fourier transform the DFT. Sorry, the DFT is Hermitian symmetry. Right? That's one. The second one, if my f has symmetric and asymmetric component, then the symmetric component can be uh, can, the DFT of that can can it will be the same as the real part of the DFT of the f. And the asymmetric component will have DFT, which is related to the imaginary part of the FT times J in this case. So that's all what from these two or three slides, uh, what you wanna really conclude, and we'll use these later in the in the lecture today. I think how you can mirror uh, the signal. So you start with this, this is given, capital F is a DFT of small f, and now if you mirror your indices and then the special domain is mirroring in the frequency domain. Um, if you if you do that in, in only in one side in a circular fashion, it's the same as doing that in the spatial domain in the same fashion, and so on. So uh, all of this is just reflection and around different uh, different axes. And are we doing a linear reflection as in this case, or are we doing a circular reflection as in these three cases? Uh, so it's, what you do in the spatial domain is the same as what you are doing in the frequency uh, domain uh, in this case. So, uh, and again, if you remember, we said before, if you had a circular shift in the spatial domain, then the real transform DFT of that is modulated with the complex exponents. And the same thing in here, if you have a circular shift of the DFT, is the same as modulating uh, with the same um, with the same uh, amount, which is K naught and L naught in the spatial domain. So it's, it's the inverse of that operation. And finally, um, the Parseval theorem still applies in DFT, uh, which means the, inner, the energy is, is really conserved in the spatial domain, the frequency domain. Uh, the inner product uh, in the spatial domain is equal to uh, the product in, this, in the frequency domain. And um, if you look at the first black diagram that we had at the very beginning, when we had transform quantization, if you really remove all the other part, uh, the quantization, the entropy coding, just have the transform transmit, then the error between F and F uh, bar is equal to a zero uh, because the transform doesn't really lose the information 
um, and we'll look at some conditions of what that uh, that, that that means. But this is really what what uh, specifically for DFT. So now, um, given everything that we have studied so far, let's see look at this idea of linear convolution versus circuit convolution. We get into this. So remember what we have. We have what we usually put this to some system that has an impulse response of H of M and N, and you get as an output G of M and N, right? And now we know that the way you calculate G of M and N is by saying, I want to calculate F convolved with H. So you do a two-dimensional convolution between H and F or between F and H, and will give you G, right? In the DTFT, we said we could do that if I can find G, which is the DTFT of F multiplied by DTFT of H, and then take the inverse DTFT of G, that will give me G, right? That's a, we, we, we claim to be an efficient way to do it. But now uh, we know the DFT, it we cannot really use it or calculate it using uh, in the computer unless we have DFT. So the question is, um, is the following. If I have the F as the DTFT of F and H, capital H is the DFT of H and G is the DFT of small g. And the question is, will if I do G is equal to F times H, and then apply the inverse DFT of G, will this, and this is the question you're trying to answer, is this G, small g, or not? And this is the question, because in the next few slides, it's extremely important that you keep in mind is that this is what we always want. What you always want is the convolution of the input with the impulse response to get the output. Now, can we do that more efficiently in the frequency domain? And now, can I use that DFT? So what that means is that, can I have DFT of the input, multiply the DFT of the impulse response with the frequency response, and then multiply them, apply the inverse DFT, will I get G? Is this, is this G the same one as this one or not? Okay, so let's look at this um, in more detail. So let's look at this in the in the one dimension case, which is easier just because of the neatness of the writing. So now imagine that we have as an input is f small f, and we have an input response h, and the output is g. Okay, so now I have capital G as the n DFT, remember n is the dimension, the size of our DFT in the 1D case, is just a capital N. In the two-dimensional case, will be n capital N capital N DFT. So capital G is the DFT of small g, capital F is the DFT of small f, and capital H is the DFT of small h. So now we can calculate by definition, g of n is one over n, sum over k, and then what we have in here is G, okay, the DFT of G. So I apply the inverse discrete Fourier transform. And I, at the same time, I replace the capital G with the product between F and H, right? Because that's what we are really trying to do. I'm trying to really get from the DFT to see what I can uh, obtain for G, small g of N. And then I have the e to the positive j 2 pi k over capital N small n. Okay, so far so good. Um, and then next, what I'm doing is I'm taking this h of k and I'm replacing that expression with the expression, which is the forward discrete Fourier transform definition that will obtain capital H from small h, which is summation over m, a dummy variable h of m e to the negative j 2 pi k small m over capital n. Again, all my DFT have the same size as capital N 
as in this in this case. And for my sequences, have the same dimension uh, for now. And then f capital F of k same, and this complex exponent is the same. Now, if I look carefully at this line here, then I can rearrange some terms. Dimension over m, h m outside to the left, and that's what we did here. Over n, summation over k inside, and then I will have with it f of k e to the j 2 pi k over n small n, and then I will have the other one over here. So now, if you look carefully at this expression here, this is but nothing but really what? This is the inverse dft definition for small f. Right? So that's how you can obtain small f of n here. However, it's multiplied by this complex exponent. And we know from the definition, this is the modulation of the dft of small f. And basically, a modulation in the frequency domain means what? Means a circular shift in the spatial domain. So I can replace this whole thing in here with a small f of n. However, we have a shift by m because of this, what we refer to as a few minutes ago, capital W, right? Sub k to the small m uh, in here. So what we have in here, what we have left, summation over m and h of m is the same as this line. And then this whole expression now is replaced with this circular shift um, by a value of small m modulated by capital N of F. And now this in here by definition, this is different from what we are used to remember or what we are used to in terms of convolution. We have H of M, F of N minus M, right? And this is M zero to N minus one. This was the linear convolution that we started some weeks ago. This one here we refer to as a circular convolution. And as a simple, we have F star within a circle H. So now what this is telling us is that when you apply this concept in here, when you apply this concept in here, whatever you obtain here, right? Not necessarily small g, this one here, what you will obtain is F circularly convolved with small h. The question now, when will the linear convolution between F and H and the circular convolution between F and H will be identical? If we know those conditional constraints, then G will be equal to the same output when we get the two dimensional convolution. So now uh, that's what we have shown so far. So now let's move to just some definition before we get into the question of when will these two uh, linear convolution and self convolution be equal to each other. So um, after all, if um, the, the goal of that is to operate and do filtering in the frequency domain, that will be faster in real life implementation. But however, there's the circular convolution issue that we have to study in more carefully. So these are just standard uh, definition of the circular convolution, f with h, h with f, the convolution between f and h, the equation between h and f, just as a as a reminder about the difference between the two. So now, in all what we have done so far, and this is something I mentioned a few times so the last 30 minutes, is that the dimension and the size of DFT is capital M times N, which is, we assume, it's equal to the dimension of our original signal F, and even with the assumption even H can be the same dimension M times N. What we will do next, so we can really understand and better really figure out this question, when will this equal to this? When will the self convolution equal to the linear convolution? So one way to, to do that is really to start to decouple these regions from each other. So to do that, this we have some variables in here. So the first thing is we have our signal F 
And let me assume that the dimension, the region of support for this small f is defined by p times q. H is defined as R by S, capital R, capital S. And now we, what we are trying to do is H, and capital means what we are applying here convolution. That's really what the word um, filtering is. And that's basically the standard linear convolution that we are doing. And if you notice in here, the summation here, the dummy variables are i and j, and they go between 0 and r minus 1 and j between 0 and s minus 1 because of the dimension of h in here. And then we have the f of m minus i and m minus j. Let me call this the linearly filtered image f with h. I just want to call it w for now as, a, as an intermediate value. So now we know from our linear convolution that the dimension for this w is between 0 and p plus r minus 1, and between 0 and q plus s minus 1. Right? We have an extension in both directions in this case. So now what we established so far in this example, we decouple the dimension of f from the dimension of h, and we just calculated w as the linear convolution between h and f. And now the next, what we will do is to look at how can we compute the linear convolution in terms of the inverse of dft. So the first thing is, let's define g as the circular convolution between h and f, and to be defined using this expression here. Now, m and n in this case in here, we are uh, stating that this m has to be larger than or equal to p plus r minus 1, and n has to be larger than or equal to q uh, plus s uh, minus minus one. So let's let's look into this in more in more detail. So what's happening in here? So take this expression, okay. And now what we will do next is, I would like to simplify this expression, the circular shift expression. I want to really use some dummy variables, small r and small s. And what these are, basically, if r and s are both r zeros, then the same as if I'm not really at the same first copy of f. If r is one and s is one, then as if I'm shifting in here, i is one and j is one and so on. So uh, I'm just simplifying the notation by Im invoking this double summation over dummy variable r and s, and I'm shifting uh, in, in multiples of r by capital, sorry, multiples of capital M by r, and multiples of capital N by s in here. So uh, I take this expression, replace it, replace the expression with that one, I will get this second line. So double summation, I'm just rearranging. Double summation of i and j, I put it inside. Double summation over r and s, take it outside. What I have left is h, i, j, and then I have this f uh, with the shifted value. What I have between these big brackets is nothing but what? This is a linear convolution between h and s minus r, m, and n minus sn, right? So I would call this the convolution. I defined it as w in the previous slide. So now the only thing is different in here. I have this extra shift in rm and sn. Because of the linearity property, then what I have in here is nothing but summation over r and s, and then the shifted version of w, um, which is the linearly filtered small f by h. And then there's the shift uh, by uh, controlled by the value capital M and capital N. However, um, the, the indexes R and S are dummy variables in this case. Uh, questions? Okay, so what we have established here on the left hand side is our G, which is what? Which is the output from a circular shift of H and F. And then what I have on the right-hand side, I have a replication of our W, which is the output from the linear shift. Okay. So now keep in mind what we're really trying to ask ourselves is this question. I'm gonna go keep going back to this question, this one here. 
when will these two be equal to each other? Which is the same as that question now became, when will this G be equal to this W, right? What are the constraints in here? So what we established from this slide in here is that G is nothing but a and this location is done capital at capital N throughout the whole plane, right? So now the question you should ask yourself is when will that be a problematic, right? So now if I'm doing replication and there is an overlap, that's a problem, right? If there's no overlap, then the same thing that we have done in sampling before. And at the very beginning of today's lecture, I was telling you that you can think of the discrete Fourier transform as you are sampling in the frequency domain. You are really getting a, replica, a replicas in the spatial domain. So all of these are linked concept to each other. So this in here, keep it that way. So the what I can see in here means circular convolution is a spatially alias version of the linear convolution within the region capital M times capital N. So now, if you are very careful in choosing this capital M and capital N, you make them large enough so that the M is larger than P plus R minus one and N larger than Q plus S minus one. Remember, W dimension is P plus R minus one times Q plus S minus one. Right? So if we choose this replication, and this is capital M, capital N, large larger than these two expressions then we don't really have any overlap in this case and if that's the case then g would be equal to w within this region of support which is controlled by capital m times capital n uh, so this uh, is the whole idea of the circle convolution and the way you calculate it algorithmically is the following um, so if you have again you have f H, and then the output in here is this called G. So now, either you do a two-dimensional convolution or use DFT. If you use DFT, then the choice for the size of the DFT that you make is very important. The size of MN DFT is the size of DFT have to be picked such as M is larger than P plus R minus one, and n other than q plus s minus one, where the dimension of f is p times q, the dimension of h is capital R times capital S. And then we zero pad h, we zero pad f, apply m by n dft for both small h and small f, and then we do an element-wise multiplication between capital H and capital F, and then from the result, we do an inverse DFT, uh, M by N DFT, and that will be, will give us small g, which is the same as the one we get from the two-dimensional convolution. So here's an example uh, on this. Uh, so assume that we have our F of M and N given by this um, four samples, and small h is given by these uh, four samples. And now we will do the steps. So the first thing is, um, um, in this specific example, I want to apply a two by two DFT. And uh, in this case, uh, I want to calculate the DFT for small f and DFT for small h. In here, we're just using the definition of DFT and straightforward uh, plug in these values. You get this DFT for small f. You can do the same thing, you can do this by hand. It's very quick, you can really get this um, DFT for small h. And I wanna use the same steps in here. I wanna do a product between, element by element between these two, um, capital F and capital H. I obtain these numbers in here. And then the same thing, I apply the inverse DFT. And again, our inverse DFT is the size is two times two inverse DFT. There's capital M, capital N choice in here, we made as to be two by two. And then um, if we do that, we get this G of M and N. Okay. 
Okay. Now, this operation here, when we apply it to this example, with the size of the FT of two by two, we obtained this. But keep in mind, did we satisfy the condition where M is larger than or equal to E plus R minus one? Is it plus R or yeah. yes, plus R minus one? Is this the case? This was two plus two minus one. That is four. M should be larger than or equal to four. However, it was not. Our M is equal to our two. Our N is a two. So we haven't, we did not satisfy this condition, right? So, so for now, our inverse discrete free transform gave us this value for G of M and N. Let's compare with the ground truth. What is really the ground truth is really to find the two dimensional convolution between these two sequences, between the input F and the input response H. If we do that, we get our W as this. And you can see from here, this W and this G, they are not equal. Why? Because we did not satisfy this condition here. So you can really visually look at what's really happening here. So imagine that our W, to keep in mind in here, the size of our W is three by three, right? I'm just giving the two by two in here, but if you look at the three by three, it's given here, right? Because P plus Q minus one. So, which is two plus two minus one, that's actually, I made a mistake there. This is three, sorry. This is three. Yes, uh, two plus two minus one, okay. So this is the dimension of the, this is the output from the linear convolution. And you can see in here, the output, what we have is two, three, one, three, two, zero, one, zero, zero. Now, remember that to obtain G, G is nothing but what? A replication tick W and keep replicating around the plane with capital M and capital N. What's capital M and capital N is two by two, right? So to take this copy, shift by two, left and right, shift by two, up and down, and so on. And keep doing that. And now what you will have, what happened is this one here, because of the replication, it came here, and this one here came here. So now you have two plus one plus one, that's a four. And that's how you obtained this value for G, right? That's how you obtain this value in here. Because the other, the three got a zero, and the three got a zero, right? But this number two in the in the, in the, in the, in the zero and zero location got a one and one, right? So this you have aliasing, all right? So you have, uh, and that why? Because you didn't have enough distance for the shift because you didn't really pick the size of the DFT right. Now, as we calculated here, the correct value for uh, DFT has to be calculated using this formula in here, this one here, right? So it should be larger than or equal to three. And we always like to operate in an even numbers because that way we can apply F50, the fast free transform. Um, so larger than or equal to three, then it's the next potential one is after two by two DFT is four by four DFT. If we do that, then we should obtain the correct one. And this is really a, an exercise for you at home because we haven't really had an exercise uh, in the homework on this. Uh, so this will be a very good exercise um, to do this uh, operation again. The only difference is now the DFT size you apply here, this one here, the DFT you apply is a four by four DF DFT. And then see, follow the same steps all the way around and then see if the W and the G you obtain will be identical or not in this case. Any questions? Okay. Okay, now let's talk about how we can calculate the DFT. 
Um, so um, this is the definition um, for the EFT. Um, so if you look at, if it's an M by N DFT, then we are doing M by N calculations for every single coefficient. And then we need M by N multiplication, and we need M by N addition. So overall we have about M square, N square uh, complexity. So now, if you look carefully at the expression of DFT, and then we'd like to really separate things. So if you look at what we have in here, as if we are operating on the columns of F first, and then that will give us an intermediate sequence, call it capital G. And now capital G, every column in capital G is the one dimensional DFT of every column in capital F or a column in capital F. And then if you plug in G in here, then this operator in here is operating on every row in capital G. So what you could do is what we have seen before, you can really operate this by having two consecutive one dimensional DFT, one operating on the rows and the other one operating on the columns. We will not study fast Fourier transform. In Python, they reduce the number of multiplication by a log factor, but we will not worry about fast free transform in this course. Uh, but and for the sake of this comparison, uh, what we had before was m square n square. If you have two consecutive one dimension DFT, and we have an example about this in DFT as well, uh, and you use um, um, the fast free transform then you have really a saving in the range of or five order of magnitude. So quite a bit of saving. But what we are really interested in, uh, how can we even save more if we have a real image? If you remember, um, we had two slides early on talking about if you have small f as a real signal, a real image, then the free transform the DFT, the DFT of that small f uh, is uh, Hermitian symmetric. So, so that will invoke it in here. And that means what? That means if I look at the columns and the rows of DFT, and if I look at column M minus one, and I look at column zero, then basically what I have is nothing but what? They are equal because they're really connected to each other because of the Hermitian symmetry between the two, right? So that's one thing that means the same thing you can apply it for column M minus two and column one, M minus three, column three and so on. So the question is, do I really need to calculate the DFT for all M columns? We don't, just, we need only half of them because, because of the Hermitian symmetry and property, we can find the remaining columns, okay? So in this case, we can really apply uh, DFT for half the columns. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is we can do this trick in here. So if we could construct a new intermediate image where the new intermediate image is complex with the real parts, right? So I take the first row in the image as the real part. I take the second row in the image as my imaginary part. I do the same thing. I take the next row as a real part, and then the fourth row as an imaginary part, and so on. So now I construct a new complex image where it has half the number of rows as the number of rows in the original image. However, each row in this complex image, the real part of it is one row in the original image, and the imaginary part is one row in the original image. So if I can do that, then now within the same DFT operation, right, I'm calculating, which is 
the FT calculations for half the number of rows in the original image. I'm calculating the FT for the entire total number of rows in the image because I have the real and the complex part. And again, we use the Hermitian symmetry as as a, as as the motivation here uh, or, or or as the mean here. So if I apply, sorry, this should be small s and small h. This should be small h. H is equal to f of n plus j uh, g of n. That's basically we are really constructing this complex image. Then the DFT is the DFT of the rows plus j DFT of the imaginary parts and the real parts. But we know that to the conjugate um, symmetric of H, I get this expression here. But I know that f by itself is real, g by itself is real. So this part in here is the same as g, conjugate of k. This part in here is the same as f of f, right? So in this case in here, the I have this expression for, uh, for our complex uh, signal, uh, uh, real image h. And now from here, I can really calculate what will be the Fourier transform for those odd rows and the Fourier transform for these even rows in my original image. If I just basically have these calculations. Um, this one should be F con. Yeah, should be F con. Okay. So now what we have done so far there are two things we have done. So the first thing is, if I can construct an intermediate complex image using alternating rows from the original image as real and imaginary parts, and they have this intermediate image in here, then within half of the DFT operation that I could have done it for the entire number of rows, the original image, I get a DFT of uh, the older rows. So now I have a saving of half the number of rows of n divided by 2. And the reason I'm doing this because of the Hermitian symmetry. Because remember, f by itself is real, small g is real. So the DFT of these both of them is also Hermitian symmetry. And the second thing we did, because the overall f is real, then we didn't really need to do the DFT for the entire because of the Hermitian symmetry. I just need to do it for half the columns, and then I know from the Hermitian symmetry how to, how to calculate for the other columns. So I have another m by 2 saving in this case. And this is basically how we can calculate the DFT for real images uh, using the Hermitian symmetry property. Uh, and before we uh, conclude today, I just want to go through how can we compute DFT not, not using the double summation definition, but using the matrix form. And here is an example. So in the matrix form, uh, what we are really trying to do, this is the first time we are really bringing this notation into the course. Um, we would like to look at images as matrices um, and the transform as matrices. And this will be very helpful when we look at DCT and DST later. So. One of the things, um, if you look at an operating matrix DFT, uh, let's just call these as a U matrix. And imagine N times N is, uh, is uh, four by four. So it's a square uh, kernel. And then now there are something, we call it base functions. Basically, what are the, the bases of DFT? From the definition of DFT, when you had double summation, small f, and then we have e to the negative j2 pi m over capital M, and e to the negative j2 pi n over capital N, right? These complex exponents are the bases, right? So if you have capital M and capital N are both are four, then you have four of them in the M, four of them in the N, so you have four by four uh, uh, bases in this case. So I can really construct my, uh, my, my this matrix 
and this matrix in here is defined by uh, uh, dimension wise by the capital M, which from now on we'll just refer to these as square. So our DFT size is always a square. DCT will always be square, like four by four, eight by eight from now on. Um, so capital M and capital N from now on will assume they are always equal. And then I have this variable a small m, a small n, will tell me which rows I am on, which columns I am on, and so on. So I can plug in here, um, and then here basically I have e to the negative j two pi over four, and then I have zeros, and then here I have both of them. Uh, one of them is zero. The next one is both of them are one. One is one, one is two, one is one, one is three, and so on. And the next one, and the next one. Right? So, so I have this u matrix, and I want to simplify this matrix uh, to this form in here. I can simplify this more. I'll come back to this slide in a minute. And this becomes my my four by four DFT kernel. So now this, if you notice in here, that why this is very important because until this minute, all what I have done, I only defined what is the dimension, the size of my DFT. I have not mentioned anything about the input image f. So which means this kernel here is independent of the input f. So I always have it as a kernel. It doesn't matter what the input is. I just want to do the multiplication and, and calculate, right? So that's the beauty of looking at this as, as is in the metric form because I have my kernel ready. So this kernel in here, just use your sports if the j pi is um, is uh, negative one and so on. Anyway, so now once I have that, then I can use this equation to compute a DFT matrix capital F uh, by using the kernel U. It having this U in here. All what I need to know know for U is what's the dimension, the size of DFT. It is four by four. Then U dimension will be four by four, and then my input image is small f. I have multiply f from the right and from the left by f by u. And then if I have this example in here, this is my input image f is a four by four image. This is multiplying by u from the right, multiply by u from the left afterward. Then this is in here is the four by four DFT of the input image f. And if you notice in here, we had a column, we have a vertical line in the input image, and now we have it as what? As a horizontal line in the in the in the DFT domain. This is what we mentioned before when we started discrete time free transform, if you remember, because uh, if you remember we had a line uh, in the input which uh, has a certain slope, P divided by Q, then the slope uh, in the Free transform V negative Q over P. So these are some examples in here. Um, this is an image, and this is a color, uh, a color uh, visualization of the DFT. And then when this is when we rotate it, as if we are rotating the DFT, as we'll see in a minute. So um, yeah, I think I can go through this. Um, yeah, maybe that's a stretch. Let me stop here. So I will continue next time talking about the rotation and how we can improve it, because that will give us a very nice tool, which is DFT in a polar coordinate. We'll study that in more detail next time. And then how we plot DFT, and then we'll have some examples, and then we'll move on to DCT next time. So today, what we have, we defined what DFT is. Uh, we look at DFT from both angles. Um, and one of them is if you are really sampling the Fourier transform in the frequency domain, which will give us this kind of periodical sequence of f in a spatial domain. And um, after that, we started to look into decoupling the size of the DFT from the region of support of f. And that actually enabled us to have a better view of um, how we can use DFT to compute the output from a linear convolution between an input and an input response. And we had the condition for that, that will satisfy, that will be, if satisfied, then the output from the circuit convolution 
and the alpha wave convolution can be uh, equal to shadow without a distortion. And we have two examples of that. And then we looked at um, some properties of the EFT, especially the Hermitian symmetric property. And that enabled us to uh, have an efficient calculation of the DFT of real segments, real images. And we had a saving in row wise by half. If we take every, the odd rows, make them as a real component, the even rows as the imaginary component in a new intermediate complex image. And once we do that, then in one shot, we are really doing uh, for each row, a single DFT. That will give us such a DFT of two rows while we really only paid for a DFT of only one row. Let's say it by half number of rows. And then because of the Hermitian symmetry for the overall uh, DFT, then we can really just calculate for half of the columns, not for all the columns. And that's another saving column wise. And finally, um, we looked at how we can calculate DFT using matrix uh, formulation. And we introduced this idea of base bases um, and the bases in the DFT are these complex exponents. Uh, and then if you have those, then you really, depends on the size of the DFT that you have, then you have the kernel that's always fixed independent of the input F. Whenever you have an input, an image, you can just do a multiplication matrix, matrices from the left and the right, and then you calculate the DFT in a matrix form. And we have some examples of that. And next we'll talk about rotation and we'll move on to um, how we can go from DCT, DFT to DCT. This is a small F. We can go to DCT and why DCT is important. Thank you and uh, we'll see you um, next uh, 